I'm Al Phil Reese, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends in the world of poetry and poetics to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of some poems or some prose. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the writing to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for some writing that interests us, some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound Archive, writing.upenn.edu slash Penn Sound. Today, Poem Talk has gone on the road, along with Poem Talk's editor, Zach Cardner, and our tech guru pal and audio meister, Chris Martin, Zach on video, Chris on audio, and we have driven up into the Hudson Valley, the mid-Hudson, and landed at Annandale on Hudson, the home of Bard College, where we have decamped and are joined by Lainey Brown, who actually Hello. came along from Philadelphia with us, whose most recent publications include an anthology, A Forest of Many Stems, Essays on the Poet's Novel, published by Nightboat, an illustrated talk called The Poet's Novel, A Form of Defiance, Kin Press, love that book, Lainey, and who has forthcoming collections of poetry. You exhaust us all, Lainey. Translation of the Lilies back into lists, waves book, wave books, and apprentice to a breathing hand, Omnidon, and who, with us at Penn, coordinates our massive open online course, ModPo, and teaches creative writing. And by Erica Kaufman, poet, teacher, and teacher's teacher. That's really what you are, a teacher's <laughs> teacher whose books include Post Classic, Roof Books 2019, and Instant Classic, Roof Books 2013, and who was co-editor of No Gender, Reflections on the Life and Work of Carrie Edwards 2009, who is the director of the Bard College Institute for Writing and Thinking, and whose essay on Joan Retallick is part of a new book. I'm going to hold it up for those of you watching this. A new book entitled The Difference is Spreading. 50 Contemporary Poets on 50 Poems. And inside this book, Erica Kaufman has an essay about Joan Retallick, also joining us, the aforementioned Joan Retallick, eminent poet, critic, theorist, multidisciplinary scholar, and teacher's teacher also, whose many books, to name just a few, include Memoir, After Images, Errata Suite, and The Poetical Wager, who is the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor Emerita of Humanities right here at Bard College, where she directed the aforementioned language and thinking program for 10 years, and who in spring 2023, I'm thrilled to say, will be visiting Philadelphia in early, early 23 as a Kelly Writers House Fellow. Joan, it is a pleasure to see you after all this time here, and very, we're already very excited about your coming to Philadelphia. As am I. <laughs> Great. Here. So glad that you joined us. Erica. Hi, Al. Tell me something good. I am so excited that you all came here from Philadelphia. Yeah. It was a fun ride. Lainey, anything about the ride worth mentioning? It's fantastic. What? You like this drive from Philly? I like it. I mean, it. we got a little stuck on the parkway, the New Jersey parkway. And as soon as my automated voice thing in the car said welcome to new york we realized we had left new jersey and now we were in a perhaps a better state and poem talk poem talk fans who just heard me say that about new jersey are going to be writing in lest you write in i'm from new jersey so it's okay well today we four have gathered here at bart to talk about two passages from the opening pages of joan retallick's essay the poetical wager in a collection of 13 essays, I guess 12 essays and an introduction that comprise a 279-page book, The Poetical Wager, published by the University of California Press in 2003, we have selected two passages from the beginning of the title essay. To be specific and helpful, we hope, for those following along in their copies of the book, the opening pages of the essay from pages 21 to 25, part of a conversation the author conducts with herself, or a version of herself, a slef interview. And second, a few paragraphs on pages 57 and 58 on Gertrude Stein, John Cage, and a few other topics. 
Every Poem Talk episode begins with a recording of the poet. And since in this unusual episode, we have the subject of our discussion, if I may call you that, right here with us, we've asked Joan to read a portion of the passages we've chosen to discuss. Note that in the interest of time, we can't feature a reading of the entire passage, but we hope what you are about to hear will give you a sense, and we urge you to read the whole passage, indeed the whole essay. So here now is Joan Ritalik reading from The Poetical Wager. Thank you, Al, for staging this and um, so welcome. saying those good things. I'm actually going to read a portion of an essay within The Poetical Wager uh, titled Wager as Essay. And this section is about Gertrude Stein and her um, essay as form. To get lost in the writing can be a way out of officially charted territory. Gertrude Stein says this, enacts this emphatically in her own essays to act out of one's unprecedented contemporariness is to be able to tolerate, even enjoy, not knowing where one is going, even in sustained forays. Stein's essays, in a tradition that continues through John Cage, Rosemary Waldrop, Leslie Scalapino, and others, literally compose, live, their way through the necessary uncertainty that transforms language according to one's sense of the active principles of change in one's time. This is to enter the event of literature as writer, reader, most directly as a form of life in Wittgenstein's sense. The language game of the exploratory experimental essay is in dynamic intercourse with the cultural contexts that form the developing rims of one's social world. If one sees change as the very definition of temporality, then the poesis of living that change is one in which the action of time is the action of composition. Stein puts it this way in Composition as Explanation. And now this is Stein. It is understood by this time that everything is the same except composition and time. Composition and the time of the composition and the time in the composition. The composition is the thing seen by everyone living in the living they are doing. They are the composing of the composition that at the time they are living is the composition of the time in which they are living. It is that that makes living a thing they are doing. Nothing else is different of that almost anyone can be certain. The time when and the time of and the time in that composition is the natural phenomena of that composition and of that perhaps everyone can be certain. No one thinks these things when they are making, when they are creating, what is the composition Naturally, no one thinks, that is, no one formulates until what is to be formulated has been made. Stein's explanation of composition, and now that's me. You would know it, I'm sure, but. <laughs> uh, Stein's explanation of composition as explanation is a fortuitous elucidation of just how the essay can elude official thought. The act of composition in the writing is radically performulaic, often thought, but, um, I'm sorry, official thought, but no existence except formula, as formula. 
The essayist in Stein's world is creating her composition in the transitional zones of the contemporary as unclassified temporal space. This is one way of understanding her phrase, continuous present. In the poetics of an experimental activity with contemporary use as the guiding value, one must always have the courage of an intention groping its way. Stein again. There was a groping for using everything, and there was a groping for a continuous present. Having naturally done this, I naturally was a little troubled with it when I read it. When I reread it myself, I lost myself in it again. Each period of living differs from any other period of living, not in the way life is, but in the way life is conducted. And that, authentically speaking, is composition. After life has been conducted in a certain way, everybody knows it, but nobody knows it. Little by little, nobody knows it as long as nobody knows it. And one creating the composition in the arts does not know it either. They are conducting life, and that makes their composition what it is. It makes their work compose as it does. And now to begin as if to begin, composition is not there. It is going to be there, and we are here. Nothing changes except composition, the composition and the time of and the time in the composition. It is an act of, uh, it is in the act of composing and only in composing that one notices and arranges memory fully lives in making something of one's contemporary experience. This has to do with the fact that being where one is in the present, as it is continuing to complicate history, is the one thing we are certain to not understand in advance. Or perhaps we understand nothing in advance. It takes everything we think we know along with everything noisily, silently, unknowable, to form the patterns that will eventually give visibility and meaning to things. Thank you, Joan. I think, I think we should start the following way. So I'm going to ask Lainey and Erica, and then I'm going to offer it myself, to pick out a point passage sentence to add to the record, say briefly what interests you about it. Then we'll invite Joan to respond to any of the three selections or remarks or anything like that. We go from there. Lainey, you got one? From what we just read. Or, or any anywhere, anywhere. Anywhere in the passage. Yeah. That we've chosen for this poem talk. Should we go to Erica? Erica, you got one? Sure. So mine is on page 23. The kind this, is in the, this is in the dialogue with the Slef, Slef version of the self. Yeah, this is Kinta in... Slef. Kinta Slef, yes, yeah. a person, a personage. A person. The kind of agency that has a chance of mattering in today's world can thrive only in a culture of acknowledged complexity, only in contexts of long-range collaborative projects that bring together multiple modes of engagement, intuition, imagination, cognition. And why did you pick that? This is one of the moments that I find to be incredibly helpful as far as thinking about the broader question of the wager of writing and the way in which to respond to the contemporary, one also needs to be engaging on a lot of different levels. So you're never only thinking about 
a single eye or a single moment, but there's a way in which everything around the moment becomes involved. Mm, wonderful. Great. Glad that cut in. Lainey, you have a passage? There's so many. I see you're just all know, over the place. It's, it's hard to choose. Um, how about on 25, um, also in the dialogue and the response to the question, but what does all that necessarily have to do with art? Certain kinds of art help us to live with nourishment and pleasure in the real world, connect us with it in ways nothing else can by shifting our attention to formally framed material conditions in ingenious mm. ways. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking about the phrases nourishment and pleasure and questions of in the real world and how that resonates in this particular moment moving through time. Fabulous. Okay, I'll add one, and then Joan can pick any point and say anything she likes about this. Um, I'm interested in the passage that we just heard. Uh, I just want to point out a phrase at the beginning of that passage and a, a bit of Cage as quoted just after the passage that Joan read, and then something a little after that. The first phrase we did hear is referring to not knowing where one is going. That is to say, being either without direction or without an aggressive sense of direction or lost. Uh, in the, I've been reading a lot of Caroline Bergvall and drift in particular. I think of drift as a concept there, as a positive, not a negative. The second little version of that is the cage quoted from Lecture on Nothing by Joan just after the passage we heard. Cage says, I have the feeling that we are getting nowhere. So it's another directionless, another lostness. And then just after that, Joan summarizing Cage's experiments, experiments in forms of living one's life that are ways of not wanting to be anywhere other than where one is. So those are three versions of something that is very counter to conventional aspiration, even to, even to liberal democracy, let's get somewhere, let's go somewhere, let's progress. And this is not going with that. This is trying something else. Well, you have three different ways you can go. What would you like to do? Actually, I, I think those three passages are related in... Um, a way that is very central to this whole book. I mean, what, what I am valuing in the various essays. And that is that, um, that one, in, in everything that one is doing, one is choosing um, a form of life that um, could be a pretty um, crappy form of life mm. <laughs> um, or could be something that, um, that invigorates you, invigorates um, others who may experience what you're doing in, in a way that... Um, is, as Cage liked to say, um, working toward being fully present and, and fully in touch with everything around one. So that there's not a, a time when you are, quote, wasting your time doing things that are not um, vital to you. I mean, are, are part of uh, life as it should be led. So the, the very, uh, the last thing that you quoted, that he, he wants always to not be anywhere other than where he is. Exactly. I mean, that, yep. um, that, uh, that's the crux of it. And for me, as a, as 
someone who writes essays which are difficult to write um, often, that is something that stops me um, periodically when I'm realizing I'm not enjoying what I'm doing. Um, and I have to figure out a way to get back into doing it in such a way, composing it, as Stein might say, so that in the, the composition, I have changed the nature of what it is that is being composed and how I am doing it. So composing is living, but it's not easy necessarily. True, true. There's, there's a moment where, is it Kinta? Kinta Slef? Yeah, Kinta. Kinta Slef says, oh, um, this is daunting. And you said, was well, daunting if your primary concern is control. <laughs> what we need is a robustly nuanced reasonableness. <laughs> One that can operate in an atmosphere of uncertainty. That's the composing is living, but it's not necessarily easy. Yeah, well, easy is not um, uh, actually a very positive part of the lexicon, as far as I'm concerned, because <laughs> difficulty, if it's worthwhile, is challenging, and that is the most stimulating thing I can imagine. I, you know, and that has, that relates to the importance of the enjoyment of complexity, of knowing how essential it is to actually our whole entangled planet I mean, everything depends on com complexity and how we handle it. And um, it's thrilling, actually, to be confronted with a complex puzzle or a complex um, thought and uh, to get to do the, the composing and the doing that is the act of puzzling until, wow. as Dr. Seuss put it, <laughs> you puzzle and puzzle until your puzzler is sore, but it doesn't matter <laughs> that oh it's sore. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I want to turn to Lainey because I know Lainey has something, <laughs> some thought here about this, which, what we're talking about. But I just wanted to say that what you just did was a remarkable summary of this, this nuanced case that's being made for wagering. It's, it can be pleasurable to wager in this way. Ah, it's, I mean, it's essential that it be pleasurable as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, and that's not a matter of um, the necessity for control. It's a matter of what one can bring oneself into in a way that wasn't clear as, um, as something you could do. It, it has to do with the excitement of experiment, for instance, right. um, which is something that is always not entirely in your control. I mean, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. I can't express surprise that you know the argument of this book and your own work ever since, because you wrote it. Of course you know it, but it is a remarkable thing to know. Lainey and then Erica, thoughts on where we are so far? I just want to repeat a couple of things you just said that I'm just, wow. <laughs> Easy is not an important part of the lexicon. And it's, and I'm not saying exactly your words, but um, it's thrilling to be confronted with complexity. And it's essential that the composition be pleasurable. So what I'm wondering is that we can't demystify the moment that allows us to make the pivot from this is not pleasurable. How do I need to rethink it? Right. It's mysterious. But I'm curious if um, Slef and Kinta is one strategy to make that happen. You mean you need a you need a in other words how is is that helpful was that part of the process mm -hmm. in this particular composition to make it more pleasurable or to oh, right to to 
Right. In other words, I just want to know about Slef and uh. Kinta and if that's connected to this process that you're describing, which is uh. the, the movement back and forth from yeah. this is hard. Oh, but this is pleasurable. This is right. Mm. That keeps happening. Well, the most important thing about Kinta Slef is that she was willing to be in conversation with me. So the whole composition is a conversation, which is my favorite way of thinking. Um, to um, have a thought and then have a response to that thought and, and so on. Um, but she, uh, she actually is there coming up with responses that I would not have come up with without her presence. Um, and, and I mean that entirely seriously. Uh, the, there's something about, and it's, it, it's not only with Kintif Slef that I've discovered this, uh, having, um, beginning to sense another, another geometry of attention that is, is um, part of another person's or a, a, another figure's um, uh, way of thinking and that, uh, I mean, you know, people talk about alter egos mm -hmm. and I think that's really what that's all about. That, um, I, you know, why, why would anyone require an alter ego or seek it out or notice it? Um, it's because our minds, if they're not swerved from, you know, the neural pathway that they happen to be on um, by something that is necessarily external to what, what the mind has been doing, what the, um, uh, you know, the, the composer has been composing, then there, there are all sorts of possible dimensions that are never going to be um, explored. So that's, um, I actually, I reread the, the pages that you said we were going to be doing, and I was, I was really impressed by Kinta Slef. <laughs> I loved <laughs> what she was coming up with. And I, again, would not have been able to come up with it without her. I um, I took two notes, both of them wrong, but I still took two notes. You know, this is what happens when one reads and puts something in the margin. The first thing I said is, sometimes Gertrude's Alice will serve that purpose. Um, that's wrong, ultimately, but there's something about St when Stein includes Alice in the conversation, things like that happen. Um, but, but the better one was this, a recollection of civilization and its discontents, which is the only, well, it's an essay, it's finally an essay where the doubtful voice or the curious voice, will. each chapter begins, I hear a dissenter, I hear a doubtful person say the following. Now it's stagey, Freud is stagey in making his argument, but it's so much better than the ego and the id and some of these other things where he's just marching forward. And this is a, this is a slef like moment for him, mm -hmm. I think. So, and it's a, it's a that's a hard argument to make. Erica Kaufman, what's what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about um, of the role of like the actual act of writing in all of this, and how you know for me what what happens in the slef interview is something crystallizes for me as somebody who thinks about writing a whole lot. And that is that so, you know, so much of what is important is learning, learning to enjoy the act that one is pursuing. And, you know, I was really struck by what Joan was saying about having to step away and figuring out a new process or procedure if something is no longer pleasurable. And, um, 
That tends to be, I mean, it's just such a radically different way from, I think, normative ways of thinking about composing, where, you know, like what if one is working towards a deadline or one has this particular purpose or audience in mind, you, you get stuck. You know, my students ask me about writer's block a lot, and it strikes me that this is an ethos that um, that is so much more open and yet more i what's being said is is i guess it's all rooted in for me at least it's reminding me of what dewey says about the importance of experience and learning by doing and how central to the composition process or the composing process or the wager is the actual act of being willing to keep going and to allow oneself to be fully present in the work and challenging oneself to figure out a way to enjoy it. You know, I do want to um, interject one thing. I I started to get a little um, concerned about the word pleasure throughout because a lot of what we tackle is um, is difficult because of what other people are going through. Let's just put it that way, mm -hmm. or what the you know the earth right now is going through, and um, so it would be it would be um, really off to call. Uh, working on that kind of difficult, troubling um, well, difficult and troubling circumstances or, or phenomena um, called, to call it pleasure it's, but it's what I think is it's, it's like the serious the idea of serious play Play um, can be just, you know, really um, pure delight. Serious play can be um, not so delightful, but totally engaging and enlivening of, of all of one's senses and so on. And the same thing goes for the... Um, you know the difficulties in with some of the the subjects that we're working on, and I think that you can still feel ah, I feel good about how I am working on this. So uh, that may not be pleasurable. You may be even in tears at times, but you just feel that you are you're doing the right thing mm -hmm. with. Um, mm -hmm that with composing in the way you're composing. I want to switch gears slightly and get to what is for me the most radical statement in the piece, in this section. Uh, it's just two sentences. What, where is it? This what is, page? Uh, this is in the, you've already, you read it, it's just below the Stein, uh -huh. on 57. The act of composition in the writing is radically pre-formulaic. Official thought has no existence except as formula. So it's a positive statement followed by a negative statement about official thought. To me, this is, and we can go a long way with this, because this is a political stance that is seeking an alternative to ideology or formulaic thinking. So, and I say anti-ideological with a tremendous amount of hesitation because there's really no such thing as anti-ideological, but the radical pre-formulaic composing is the living you seek. And official thought has no existence except as formula, so we need to avoid that. And the one, one of the ways to understand what Stein means by continuous present is a way of finding an alternative to formulaic thought. Mm -hmm. That is... Genius. I mean, it's a genius idea. Stein's yours. And I would love for you to comment on the political implications of that, which you don't, you're not exploring that here. Mm -hmm. But official thought is not where we want to go. Oh, definitely not. I, um, 
So I, he's poet, po- the poetic, <laughs> radically pre-formulaic. That's what we seek. Yeah, yeah. Well, that um, it's it, it's interesting to me that you you focused on that because I'm it's something I'm working on right now in, in another project that I'm doing, and. Um, in uh, doing some research that has to do with um, the way our brain works in relation to the the known and the unknown mm. and um, the way in which it, it actually it's linked to the um, the idea of habitus of uh, Pierre Bourdieu that uh, the habitus is um, already suffused with ways of thinking that it is in one way or another um, infusing into the people in the habitus by having formulaic and official rules of what is is um, considered uh, legitimate, what isn't, and that goes into forms of speech, and so most certainly, yeah, and the so there's a uh, a wonderful theorist and but who does uh, empirical work on the way we move language through our our um, physiology, our biological, you know, neural networks. And um, one of the things that he points out is that when we're speaking in ad hoc ways, like we are now, uh, that often we are using suites of words. He doesn't use that term exactly, but, but that's I love a favorite that word idea of yours. Of, of, yes, a, a suite of words that just go together, and we and they um, they float around, you know, in the um, the atmosphere that everyone is breathing and you know breathing into and out of, and. Uh, the that saves time. It um, it saves the kind of time that trying to figure out what you're saying the way we all are. And you know, I'm very aware of you know. It's I have no ready formulations. I, I indeed I've got to struggle to get these these ideas together. Um, that. That is a major part of the um, the speech acts, the the performance of speech, of everyone in the culture. And what I realized is that um, that that is just in that we know why it is so important to have playful language with young children. To have poetry, <laughs> um, because poet, po- the serious play or the um, the pleasurable play. I mean, starting with Mother Goose and you know rhymes and all of that sort of stuff. But but into what we all have been doing is absolutely necessary to keep us out of habits that that in which we become automatons we are just you know the language is speaking us in other words imagine uh, non-habitual language as a way for children to learn how to live how to compose their living yeah imagine that yeah. i mean dewey got mentioned that mm-hmm. learner-centered learning is relevant mm-hmm. I, I, I just want to quote a sentence that's in that passage that I skipped when I went to the continuous present and then turned to Lainey, who I think, judging from her expression, is as excited I, as I am about this conversation, makes me want to stop the recording and go write something. You know, that's how excited <laughs> it is. It's the, this is the sentence, Lainey. The essayist, so we're getting to an unclassified temporal space, right? A space where you can compose 
or to live. The essayist in Stein's world is creating her composition in the transitional zones of the contemporary as unclassified, non-formulaic, temporal space. That's the opposite of the habitus. Lainey, over to you. What are you thinking? Well, this connects to a part, a section in the middle of 58 about unknowing. It takes everything we think we know along with everything noisily, silently unknowable to form the patterns that will eventually give visibility to the meaning of things. So I'm tangled in the I'm tangled in the in the syntax there, but I'm thinking about something that you just said about um, the willingness to be in the indeterminate space as part of the process, which enables this continuous present, this composing as we go, unknowing where we're going as an essential part of that. Uh, and did aliveness. you solve the noisily, silently, slash, I mean, I think that the, the simultaneity of the opposites is part of the unknowable. Is one way to mm -hmm. look at it. I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm curious yeah. what you think. Well, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting to, to, to be reading a piece that is so devoted in response to Slef, Ms. Slef, is so devoted to a kind of, I don't, I'm, forgive me for this phrase, but a utopian kind of pragmatism that, um, that leads to valuing unknowability. That's that hard. It takes for, everything we know to get to the willingness to unknow. <laughs> Yeah, I well, I think the I mean for me un, un not knowing is all over <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there there is um, and that's actually that's that's why I started using the phrase geometries of attention because um there's just so much going on that um, will always be unknowable, unknown, unnoticed, actually. Uh, if there isn't a, um, a way of isolating some values that, that lead you to what you think is essential to be noticed if there is going to be a, um, a healthy way of living, you know, together among ourselves, et cetera. Um, but also the, you know, I, I realize I never did directly say anything about your uh, question that featured uh, official thought or um, I thought it was a great response but please say more well I just wanted I just wanted to put a word in for Adorno because his um, wonderful essay which is um, titled the essay as form is entirely about the necessity to counter official thought and um, and he says, and I actually quoted it somewhere, and I think on the edges of the chosen pages, right. it wasn't right. in there, but that um, the um, the innermost, what does how, how does he put it? The innermost um, character of the essay is heresy. It must be heresy. Mm. And the heresy must be directed at official thought. So in that, he's really bringing together all of the various kinds of official thought we have, from religions to um, uh, oligarchies and uh, so on. And I think it's uh, I think it's a, a key 
a, a key thing that we we have to be on the lookout for because it's um, it's always sneaking up on us. Mm. A little above that, you refer to actually a specific essay, Waldrop's essay, but this uh -huh. could be said of general essays. Despite all the precautions against it, this essay does in fact turn out to be a kind of utopian enactment, a playful movement through the safety zone the essay genre provides, constructing something instructive out of the inability to make decisions, which is Montaigne, mm -hmm. or to conclude, like Adorno, the inability to conclude or to make a systematic whole out of the notes, like Wittgenstein, while rearranging the residue of history in an unmistakably contemporary manner like Stein and Cage. You've done a lot of summarizing there brilliantly, <laughs> but the thing that's so amazing is this idea of constructing something instructive out of the inability to decide. That's what an essay mm. should do. Which means that you always are not getting anywhere um, in certain ways. You're, you know, you're in convert. I, I think of all essay as being uh, essentially conversational, whether you've got, right. you know, the explicit form of the conversation or not. Right. And um, the, I think the, the really important goal of the essay is to have shifted a few things in that conversation so that you you have new territory to explore, mm. new possibilities, mm. uh, not that you've solved any of the problems. Erica, you, I'm sure you had a million questions, but I'm gonna do my usual thing of directing you, if that's okay. No doubt you've taught this, so, you know, you quoted Dewey earlier. I mentioned the learner said in learning, this is a meta essay for learning and teaching. Can you just say a little, a little bit about why it works to be taught and how people respond to it, knowing that it's actually talking to them about how they can write and compose and live? You would think that would go over pretty well, but what's it like? <laughs> um. I want to read a sentence that I think will help us to speak to that. That is also perhaps what Joan was referring to before when mentioning Adorno. Mm -hmm. um, and it's at the bottom of 56. The essayist, by virtue of peculiar means, may project new geometries of attention, oblique vectors ricocheting between authoritative generic poles describing unforeseen patterns. Writer and reader wander in lush untranslatability, surveying <laughs> new territory as they go. Um, and that's, that's a moment that um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, Writer, the, reader, teacher, student? All of it, yeah. Um, and when I've, when I've taught this essay with um, undergraduate students, that tends to actually be a strange aha moment, largely because I think that a lot of what's happening in this essay as a reader, writer, teacher is, is meta. So it's, it's enacting what it's talking about, right? So when I'm working on a text, on this text with students, you know, we might spend an entire class session on those two sentences because there's so much there, but there's also a way in which it's countering everything that students have learned before college. Can you read it again? Yeah. Um, the essayist, by virtue of peculiar means, may project new geometries of attention, oblique vectors ricocheting between authoritative generic poles describing unforeseen patterns. Writer and reader wander in lush untranslatability, surveying new territory as they go. And um, you know, and this is a sentence that's coming just after a bit on the swerve. 
So, you know, something that, that I talk a lot about with students, which is language that I think I've gotten from this book and from Joan, is the idea of, um, of the essay as absolutely needing to have something at stake that's driving it. And what that often means for students is that they don't know where they're going, right? They, they have this thing that they care a lot about that they want to explore, but figuring out how to do that exploration in a way that's quite serious and playful to kind of borrow language that you were using before, Joan, you know, the how of actually learning to enact that is really, really hard. And it's certainly the polar opposite from anything like a five paragraph essay type thing. To be sure. And the version of a class session that is like the five paragraph essay is exactly the formulaic, the equivalent to the formulaic language that is going to subvert any effort to th move through those lush spaces that you described. So the course, the class, must be as lush and wandery. So earlier you said one of the, I, you said you know one of the reasons we admire what Joan Ritalik is doing here is that it always Joan's writing always does what it is saying. It doesn't accept exempt itself from the doing because that would be unethical. That would be wrong. So this is an essay that and does... And wouldn't be fun. <laughs> and wouldn't be fun and wouldn't have been so s hard for Slef to, you know, to go all the way with it. Slef has to resist. Lainey, what are you thinking? This is, this I'm, is, uh, I'm glad you know, we're on to pedagogy. I have to say something. Please. This conversation is so much fun. You, <laughs> I'm enjoying <laughs> you so much. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. I mean, this is really, I, I hope that this poem talk, which is an unusual yeah. one, because we're dealing with <laughs> an essay and we're dealing with big ideas. We are dealing with an aesthetics here. Absolutely. It goes along with poem talks. But it's a chance for us to be with someone who's written this quite a while ago and really get it. Try to, I mean, I think this could be instructive. And by the way, speaking of the doing what we're saying, as Joan pointed out, this conversation itself has to be wandering around in those lush transitional spaces, just as it has been. So I say things like, Lainey, what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've asked a question yet. I'm thinking how uh, your comment about your favorite way of thinking is being in conversation is so anthemic to exactly what mm -hmm. we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I also just want to hang out a little longer in this magnificent sentence, writer and reader wander in lush untranslatability, surveying new territory as they go. Um, because it, I think it's so illustrative of what we're talking about. We can even go further. It's like we're, we're, we, we set out on a path through the woods and we just took a few steps. I'm like, but wait, let's Let's keep going into that sentence. So, I mean, the first part is the writer and the reader are both implicated in the process. It's not the writer saying, let me tell you something so, reader, you can learn. It's the collaborative creation of meaning, and the writer and the reader are both implicated. And then wander. That's open. In lush which we usually imagine green, decadent foliage, right? Untranslatability. So that, that juxtaposition, untranslatability, would be conventionally thought of as, oh, problem, oh, obstacle. But no, it's the opposite. It's, it's lush. That is the capacious space where we can wander in the productive unknowing and lostness, untranslatability, sorry, lush. Untranslatability, unknowability is lush. It's a, it's a place to hang out and explore. And it's not explore. arid. And it's no, not it's not a desert. Like the kind of desert of high, high theory. It right. is lush. It can it's sustain Rousseauian. us. It's back to that <laughs> nourishing, sustaining, <laughs> serious play, pleasurable. Like in other words, there's sustenance in the untranslatable. 
It's not wilderness or it's wild, but it, there's a lot of vividness there. And the word surveying is totally fascinating too because surveying is different than noticing. And so, you know, I'm, I'm imagining um, the act of surveying to kind of be taking in the lushness and figuring out what's actually there that one is noticing in that moment. Well, I keep thinking about Kintislef wanting, in the, for the best of reasons, wanting a chance, this is the bottom of 22, a, a, a chance of charting some kind of predictable trajectory, you know? I mean, that's a reasonable position. And then JR says, and this is, you're being pretty tough here. This is a, there's a bit of finger wagging at the sciences. That's the probabilistic approach of the sciences. sciences. I think it's just what we have to relinquish in the arts, that illusion of predictable trajectories. Think of how narrow a trajectory must be in order for it to remain predictable. And here's my favorite part. An obsession with the predictable is what leads people to confuse ethics with censorship in relation to the arts. Joan, I think that is amazing, and I wonder if you'd be willing to elaborate a little more, the confusion of ethics with censorship, the idea that we are heading in a certain direction, and if we're not if we're going off in another direction, we need to stop it. We need to recenter ourselves. We need to, need to use the right language. We need to go a certain way. Well, you've just said it all. I mean, that is, that is what censorship is. And I mean, an ethos is something that each of us has to compose for ourselves. I mean, you know, in in conversation with the culture that we're in and with, you know, the things that we value and so on, uh, being told what you must do for reasons that you may not agree with but must comply with is has nothing to do with ethics. It has to do with um, rules given by someone who has too much power and and uh and it's problematic so i mean i think they're at opposite ends of not even the same spectrum actually it's 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 not um they have nothing to do with each other <laughs> and in writing this translates into the the opposite of a predictable trajectory must be a dubious prototype of a difficult process. That's the, that's the, that is the alternative. Okay, so what we're going to do, we could talk forever about this. In fact, we should, I think. But we might run out of tape. And we might run out of listeners and viewers. Well, so That's true. <laughs> May I just actually interject one please. thing? Please. Oh, please. I would not be so hard on the sciences now. I'm, I was actually surprised by that. To see that, yeah. <laughs> um, so I... You know. Well, I think you're, this is the dialogue with Kintus Left that you're working out, so everybody has to overstate a little in order to you know, keep the dialogue going. No, uh, I, I don't want to be taken off the hook. I think okay. that was not, that's not something I stand by. Let the record show. <laughs> and while we're correcting the record, in the introduction I referred to you as having led the Institute for 10 years. Boy, that took five years off of your career there. So True. you did and for actually, 15 I didn't, years. I didn't lead the institute, which is what Erica's doing Erica now. does. I, I directed the language and thinking Language program. and thinking. But, you know, this... Those of us outside Bard don't know the difference between <laughs> <You're> those <right. laughs> things. But 15 years, and Erica, how many years so far? Um, if you count them all. I have been the director for four years but I've been working with, with the Institute for much longer. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and I began in the language and thinking program in you 2007. Worked, you sort of worked for Joan at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad we're all together. Um, well, speaking of thinking and learning and writing, what we're going to do now is 
offer final thoughts. It can be, it doesn't have to be summarizing. In fact, that would be wrong, I think, for this conversation. Just another point, passage, idea, thought that we didn't say yet. There's so much one could say, something to add. So who's ready? I can see Erica's looking, so I'm I'll go ready. to Lainey. Um, just to point to a tiny part of the dialogue that I really love, on page 26, Quintus Leff says, let's return to poetics. And J.R. says, when did we leave? And <laughs> I find this such a useful reminder of this kind of seamlessness and simultaneity of, of poetry. And I also, this sentence is so important. A poetics can only take you so far without an H. <laughs> Thank you, Lena. That was perfect. Erica, final thought? Yeah, I, I wanted to draw attention to the exchange between Slef and Ritalik just above what we were talking about before with um, censorship in relation to the arts. So um, the moment that, that feels important to kind of say out loud is um, to launch our hopes into the unknown, the future, by engaging positively with otherness and unintelligibility. Like that, that seems to just really in quite a beautiful way, say something that we've been talking about as far as the wager of the essay. And, um, you know, the essay is an act of, of figuring things out and also an act of, of serious conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. Joan, do you have a final thought? Well, I have, I have some thoughts, but I, I would rather this end with... Non-final thoughts. Your f thoughts. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, That's the, the you are really a guru because that is the first time anybody has ever done that. <laughs> you know, you want. That's great. That's totally in line with your mode. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, okay. I'll get a final thought. Um, I every time. I, so I have in my head the sound of Joan Retallick. It's in it's in pen sound. It's some recorder in, or another reading Stein on composition. I believe it must have been at an event at the writer's house at some point. I think it might have been, I arranged a nine poets write themselves through another poet and you chose Stein. I may be wrong about the occasion, but anyway, it's in, the audio is in pen sound. And I also teach that. I have accept, excerpted that and teach that when I teach Stein. So I have your reading in my ear of that. Stein and it is like in the blood you know it is just inside my ear it's an earworm in the best sense um, hearing you read it since the passage I asked you to read at the beginning included reading that passage brought me it's like a a happy anti-traumatic non-stress order <laughs> to hear it again and I just want to read it back into the record in my voice which is definitely not your voice, because it is, it reminds me of, you know, I've been reading a lot of people writing in the 60s, counterculture, non-famous people, writing letters, talking to people, recording their voices, and they sort of, it, this Steinian sound sort of sounds like p what people were saying later at a point when they wanted to press the reset button on what life is, and that's what I hear in here. The composition is the thing seen by everyone living in the living they are doing. They are the composing of the composition that at the time they are living is the composition of the time in which they are living. It is that that makes living a thing they are doing. That is so, you know, so countercultural is an understatement. And I just wanted to honor the fact that that idea is associated with you and this work, this particular work that we chose to talk about today. Well, I forgot to warn you guys, we like to end Pone Talk with a minute or two of Gathering Paradise, which is a chance for us to just mention a book, a poet, a film, 
piece of music, something that we have been reading or taking in that we want to recommend to other people. And I did forget to remind you, so I wonder who's got one. Got Lainey it. remembers always. I don't know about always, but so Eric and John have a minute to think. Now, I'm really excited. Um, there's a new book by Renee Gladman from Wave Books that has both writing and drawing. It's called Plans from Sentences. And I have just one sentence I want to read, which really connects to this conversation, which is not too surprising. She writes, These sentences will ache a massive threading of forms and will not know knowing. I love that. Would you read that again? Yeah. Can you, can you get it quickly? Yes. These sentences will ache a massive threading of forms and will not know knowing. Lovely. Erica, do you have a gathering paradise? I do. Um, I, I have fallen in love with this book that, um, that I learned about the last time I was in Philadelphia by your colleague, Ahmad Almala, mm, and the book is English. called Bitter English, mm -hmm. which is just an extraordinary book of poetry that, that thinks about um, language and translatability in very serious and, and really powerful ways. Thank you. Bitter English, Ahmad Almala. Joan, do you have a recommendation? Yeah, I do. Um, it's a book by Miranda Mellis, whom I think a lot of us here know. And um, it's called Demystification. Um, she, and it, it's out from Solid Objects uh, Press. And it's a, um, uh, a composition of her writing and the writing of others, um, particularly aphorisms, with a lot of um, space in between them. And, and uh, the, the way she chooses to put things together by other people don't have um, any sort of immediate logic to them that I, and I love that. <laughs> I am actually um, feeling, I have it right now uh, by, on my bedside table, and I often wake up at around 3, 3 a.m. and my mind is just going too fast, and I, I'm, I've been reading that, it slows me down, it actually draws me into a space that is definitely not um, prefigured or, you know, any of the things that, that we were talking not about. Not formulaic. Like not formulaic. So, and I'm amazed. It's like nothing that she's done before. It just, it's out of the blue. And out of the blue is where I think the best things come. Especially <laughs> at 3 a.m. <laughs> Can you repeat the uh, author and the title? Yeah. The, the author is Miranda Mellis, M-E-L-L-I-S. She actually um, taught with us for years in the Language and Thinking program. And uh, the title is one word. It's a continuous word, demystification. And uh, it's solid objects, a small press um, that's done a beautiful job. Among other things, it, it doesn't have footnotes about, you know, who did what. It has a chart that is amazing, that is in a, is folded. Um, it, it's almost a kind of chart as origami that is in a, um, a pocket in the, the uh, back cover of the book, Very the cool. inside. And, and so, Actually, even the playfulness of that chart is part of what makes it so amazing. So at 3 a.m., 
you don't want to take that chart out and start playing with it. It's probably better just to dwell on the writing or yeah, something. Yeah, <laughs> it's more the, yeah. But, but I mean, it's, it's a manageable chart, mm. but you're right. Well, I, we have not had enough recommendations for what to do when you're sleepless on Poem Talk. <laughs> Seriously. And I guess that 50% of our audience is probably getting <laughs> up at 3 a.m. and thinking about a lot of things because we're thinking too much. My, my Gathering Paradise is this book, which is a bit of a puff self-promotion because I'm, one of the, I'm the co-editor, but whatever. I don't usually do this. The Difference is Spreading, 50 Contemporary Poets on 50 Poems, edited with, with, with our pal Anna Strong Safford. And there are 50 essays, and one of them is an essay by Erica Kaufman. And it's about Joan Ritalik. And it's about a, a piece that we talk about in Mod Poe a lot, not a cage. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful piece. You're getting nervous just, just my <laughs> mentioning it. But I just want to, I want to quote just a little bit of it, okay? In, of course, Erica's talking about this, what we do when we read this poem, not a cage. We push ourselves to try to make our own paths from line to line as our eyes notice enjambments closely. And then what is at stake is the discovery of new kinds of sense making. One might describe this experience as making live and conscious history in common. The idea that content is alive and transient and conscious history becomes something to be made. That so aligns with what we've been talking about today. Well, that's all the composing one's way through necessary uncertainty we have time for on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House is a collaboration of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing and the Kelly Writer's House at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA, and the Poetry Foundation, poetryfoundation.org. Thanks so much to my guest, Lainey Brown, for coming all this way up to the Hudson Valley, Erica Kaufman. Thank you for walking a few feet from your office for joining us. And Joan Ritalik, it is such a pleasure in all senses to see you again and to have you in conversation. And to Poem Talks directors and engineers today who came all the way from Philly as well, lugging a lot of equipment. Zach Cardner doing video and Chris Martin doing audio and a shout out to the wonderful, talented, audiographically brilliant, technically superb Chris Funkhauser, who is hanging around with us today, who's also a delight to see. And to Poem Talk's editor, the same Zach Cardner. And a shout out to Nathan and Elizabeth Light for their very generous support of Poem Talk. Next time on Poem Talk, we'll be back at the Writer's House in Philly, where I'll be convening Carlos DeSena, Dag Wubchet, and Hamid Arvas to talk about a much already discussed poem written by a then 20-year-old Harvard student, John Ashbery. The poem is Some Trees. This is Al Philries, and I hope you'll join us next month for that or another episode of Poem Talk. <laughs>